I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Creek Devil. Tom, would you like to introduce our guest today? I would, absolutely. Before we do that, I just want to thank everybody for tuning in this week. And um, if you like the show, there's one way to let us know. That's click the like and subscribe button if you haven't subscribed. And I just want to thank all of our new Patreons. Uh, we just got a bunch of them this week. So thank you, guys. We'll put that in the description. We like to do a shout out to that. And um, we have John from Alabama. And John's had a couple of things. He's got some activity on his property. But also, John has a background in psychology. So we emailed him some questions that we thought were uh, relevant to our topic. So I'm going to introduce John. I'll hand the mic to him, and I think we'll start off talking about the uh, what's going on with uh, with this thing on his property. Sure. Uh, thanks for having me. First off, love the show. Uh, yeah. So it started. I think. I mean, off and on, I've heard things that I just can't align with. You know animals that we have in northern Alabama because we don't really have like I told you before we don't really have a lot of large animals you know uh I mean maybe bobcats and white-tailed deer is about as big as it gets here because we don't even have bears uh so one night of recently I think this was three weeks ago now uh on a Saturday night I was outside running the car for something and it's always when I hear it, it's from, there's a field behind our house, a cotton field behind our house. And I heard just a mammoth scream back there. And then our neighbor's dog. Now I don't mean my, like my direct neighbors. It was just my neighbors uh, down the street. Uh, a bunch of them have dogs and whatnot. And they were going absolutely crazy. And like I told you, the first time we spoke, they, they stomped all of a sudden and one just cried out in pain. Like, for a good five or 10 seconds uh, directly right after that uh, howl that I heard, howl slash scream. Uh, so well, it was intense. And I've heard, you know, kind of howls back there before that, I, like I said, I couldn't really line up with any animal that we have native to Alabama. But uh, this one was definitely more pronounced. And then what really freaked me out was, you know, the, the dogs acting really weird because I'd never noticed that before. And then the one that sounded like it had just been picked up and for lack of a better term, just destroyed. <laughs> uh, it, it, uh, cause it, it howled in pain. You know, well, you can tell what a dog's whimpers in pain and yet, ye you know, yelps in pain. And then it just immediately cut off the yelping. Uh, so yeah, it was, uh, it was creepy. I'm well, you and I, up. We talked about that. And um, the uh, the thing that caught my attention, not only the yelping and pain, because that's something that is, there just seems to be a relationship between these things and dogs, and it's never a good one. Uh, they mm -hmm. do, they injure, they, you know, they kill dogs. I guess they just don't like them. I don't know. But right. the, the other thing that caught my attention was the barking stopped all at once. And mm -hmm. I said, that exactly um mirrored an incident a uh, situation that my wife and i had experienced camping here in oregon uh up in the cascade mountains like one or two in the morning these things you'd hear these scream barks and the dogs started barking and there's like two or three camps where the dogs are barking and then as they're going off, there's just a cacophony of barking. In mid-bark, every dog stopped simultaneously mm -hmm. at once. It's like they got the memo, they shut up. <laughs> You're right. And, uh, and then when you told me that, that was <clears throat> second time I've heard 
somebody, you know, describing that kind of a situation. So, and yeah. obviously the dog got the memo because I don't know what happened to that one dog. Yeah. Um, I mean, and it's, I mean, it, you know, from the Sasquatch perspective, it makes sense because, you know, if you're a, a being that operates chiefly under stealth, right? Then, you know, a, a dog, if you're, you know, trying to prowl around to get, you know, maybe it just wanted their food or some kind of food on the property. Uh, you got to get rid of that. I'm sure that's got to be annoying. You know, it's annoying for me as a neighbor, much less if I was trying to get <laughs> some food right. on their property. <laughs> well, and the other thing that I found interesting is, you now when you hear these scream howls, um, does it catch your attention as, you're trying to do a process of elimination. What in the heck is that? Right. Well, like I said, there's just nothing in Alabama that can remotely, even if we did have black bears, which I mean, there might be, mm -hmm. there's just not. And I mean, not if there is, there's not, there's few and far between. Uh, they, they work, they don't, you know, they kind of do like a bark, you know, that's not much. They don't make a lot of, you know, they're not real loud. No, uh, no nothing else going to mean this was very, and like I told you, it was very, the best way I knew to describe it, it was, it was very, I compared it to that singer. If you remember, like, like singing, like you hear some singers and they'll be very, you know, it's all about the tonality of the voice, but then others will be very breathy. And this was a very breathy howl slash scream. It's good to scream. It had some, it moved some air. <laughs> uh, and yeah, just based on, you know, uh, process of elimination. I, I don't, you know, that's all did I'm coming have, up with. Yeah. Did it have a, um, I'm just going to ask this question. Did it <laughs> almost have like a human quality, but more different? Yeah, it wasn't as, it wasn't as deep as I thought it would be. I mean, that may be just because of the distance. I don't know how far it was, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it did, but, you know, I mean, if we had four times the lung capacity, probably, because it had a lot of, like I said, it was just powerful. And like I said, I don't know the distance, but, you know, even at what I'm assuming was at least a couple of hundred yards, uh, it was. Well, I've heard it described, sure. yeah, yeah, and I've heard it described that they carry multiple concurrent, like maybe up to seven octaves concurrently in some of their screams not not, not in all of them but i've heard those right. loud screams and you know quite frankly um you know my wife and i are camping a different different situation different time but late in the afternoon from way on the other side of this lake and then deep into the forest we heard these screams and it's a real what the heck is that and it's, mm -hmm. it, it's attention grabbing and it seems to have like the vo not not just the volume but it's, it's like wow this thing's got a locomotive uh compressor right. behind it you know this is powerful and if it was it didn't make sense too because if it was directed toward the dogs as an intimidation thing to get them to you know go away or stop or at least shut up uh because i doubt it, it was much more powerful than i think well, I mean, I'm just obviously assuming here because we have to do a lot of that. But if it it definitely wasn't a communication to another one, I don't think, because it was a very aggressive. I, I feel like it was aimed towards those dogs is what I'm saying. I bet it was, sure. Have you ever had a chance to kind of have a nonchalant discussion with your neighbor? Hey, you know, I heard something a while back and how's the dogs doing? Yeah, no, I need to. I've thought about that. He's constantly outside. Uh, he has like a target practice range where he's uh, he's a, a has to be a gun collector or a gun, you know, aficionado. So he's always out there shooting something. So uh, I've had multiple chances to go up and talk to him, and I need to. But it's you know, that's a bit beyond. Uh, it's it's tricky. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, I understand. I, I got you. Um, and, you know, one of the other things that kind of caught my attention was, and we're not going to get a location away, but the location where you live is mm -hmm. um, 
you said it has historic precedence. Uh, there's some local lore of, of Harry Man or something like that. Yes. And in, in the area. And so right. um, I guess kind of my thoughts are, uh, you know, it almost should come as no surprise to anybody that uh, these things, it's a repeating pattern. It goes back millennia. And so when you have the historic, um, you know, the, the historic background of these things, mm-hmm. it, it makes a difference. Mm-hmm. What uh, give us if you have any examples or what can you tell us about the lore of the hairy man in, in this area? So I've always just hold it, heard it called uh, the wild man. Uh, and I have friends and their parents and even grandparents who have talked about seeing it while hunting. Uh, and they even spent, I've never, you know, of course I've only had, you know, the audio encounters, uh, and, but they would talk about it chasing, uh, the last time I talked to my friend about it was he was hunting up in a deer stand on top of like an old, uh, railroad trail or whatever you want to call it. So it was really high up. He could see really far. Uh, and he just saw this bipedal figure granted. I think it was a couple of hundred, uh, yards away, but he just saw it. It was just taking off chasing something and it just completely cleared, uh, a barbed wire fence. And that was like right at dusk. And I've told him he needs to talk to you guys about it. Cause he could give much more detail. That's he has encountered it twice on that property. And that's, it's a, it's the County below my, the County I live in, but it's not that far away. Uh, so, I mean, it's definitely, I think, I don't know. Have y'all ever studied that about the travel range of these? Like how far they travel? I'm sure it's probably a pretty good distance. I've always wondered that. Uh, yeah, they, they, I think it depends. Uh, Will knows a bit about it, but I think um, different groups and different types, some of them I think tend to be, um, you know, you may have a resident group, but I think they actually have a, well, what do you know about the home range? Some of these things well, can have a pretty substantial. It's it's going to be different in that part of the country. It's dictated by terrain and terrain features. But um, mm-hmm. I'll give you an example as far as travel. In the Bluff Creek area back in the 60s, they found uh, or were able to identify individuals by the footprints. And they found this one particular footprint they'd seen a number of times. We're talking, you know, John Green, Renee DeHand, and those guys. Um, mm mm-hmm. And the one set of prints was found one particular year, and the next year it was 150 miles south of that area, the same print. Okay. So they can travel quite a okay. distance. Yeah. yeah, I figured it would probably be, you know, adequate for this area. Because, I mean, that, what I'm talking about, the sightings that I've always talked about, I've heard about since, I mean, I was little, that's only probably tops 20 miles from here, maybe. You know, it's just not that far. Uh, so yeah, I figured it would be definitely well within the range. Cause I mean, compared to you guys' uh, terrain, I mean, it's, I doubt they would have a hard, hard time of it here considering, uh, versus what they would be like in the Pacific Northwest. Cause here it would be pretty, I feel like, especially for an animal like that or whatever, uh, it'd be pretty easy cause the terrain here is fairly straightforward. What was the uh, what was your friend's reaction when he you know he's telling you that he saw this bipedal thing? How was he? Uh, you know, what was his reaction to that? Mainly confusion. Uh, he's always been in you know he's an outdoors guy to the T, but you know I think and I think that's the type of person that generally shakes up more you know because they have a you know probably more accurate, you know, view of the outdoors than probably even someone like me. Uh, but well, have expectations. Was, right. Right. So that is why I say he was, you know, when he, that's what I remember him describing it to me. And he was more, obviously it scared him too. Cause it was right, you know, as he was getting ready to leave. And I think that sealed the deal for no more hunting for the day for the him. Cause it was getting near evening and he had, let's tell about how many hundreds of yards to, you know, walk out of the woods. So, uh, (laughs) 
you know, it was mainly confusion and fear. I think a good, a good healthy mix of those two, whichever one I, loves. I, I like that. I like your, the way you put it, that seals the deal. That, that would seal the deal for me. It's like, okay, well, right. time to go. <laughs> yeah. And I've been uh, in that deer stand with him before and you just feel like you're so vulnerable. I don't know why, but being up, it's it's up so high in the air. I'm not kidding. It is because it's him and his dad builds these deer stands, and I mean they build them out of like pine tree trunks, and they build them up high in the air, like the whole thing, like twenty feet, twenty thirty feet in the air, and then they build that one on like a train trestle. So it's it's way up there in the air, but you feel so isolated, and I can't even imagine. I wasn't ever with him when he, the two times he encountered that uh, the wild man, they call it, but. Yeah, I would have been out of there as quick as. Well, I hope we do get a chance to. Yeah, I hope we get a chance to talk to this guy. That sounds sounds pretty incredible. You remember what they said, Tom? Uh, in the, the second Jurassic Park movie, go pie. That was a convenient biting height. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I doubt it. If it got wind of him, just because he was in that, I seriously doubt it would have uh, deterred it much. But, you know, one of the other things, and when you and I were talking, this is, what, two, three weeks ago, um, mm-hmm. I don't remember how we got on the subject, but we got on the subject of hummingbird feeders. And right. you had mentioned the hum- you know, hummingbirds are basically gone now, you know, maybe one or two. Yep. They're, they're, and that those one or two hummingbirds seem to be drinking a lot of hummingbird juice quickly, right? Yep. Yeah, and I, and I haven't thought about that even since because we put out some. We just got a uh, kitten recently, and we put up one of those little seats that they can sit in the window, and we put out. We actually put out seed, either last night or the night before that, and no, none of even the normal like the local birds, you know, even during the winter that stick around, they're not even feeding out of that or anything because these those seeds are still down there. So I don't if they're just you know somewhere else now or whatever so there's i don't know what it could be <laughs> besides that because yeah i mean that well, sugar we, water is disappearing yeah is so is the um i don't know i guess it's hummingbird nectar um sugar water red sugar water is that still happening where yeah. it's uh, getting depleted quickly well we're not putting it out as much now just because there's you know I don't, those those birds I mean, we talked probably about a week ago, a week or two ago, because uh, the, like I said, the, you know, the regular birds don't really feed in that that much. Uh, so when I say regular birds, you know, not humming, not hummingbirds. Uh, so, but yeah, but I mean, it was for a good month, at least. Uh, I thought about doing it again just to just to put it out there, but that's quite. Uh, discomforting tom <laughs> i think that home. was i think that was happening with carol's place in missouri it was and i just wanted to make it clear to our audience what's going on <clears throat> is uh john was your wife is into hummingbirds and so she has mm-hmm. multiple feeders or oh yeah just she one. Had usually about four or five of them and they were getting depleted how how rapidly uh I mean, usually about right at a day, day and a half, and which is not normal. I mean, back in the summer when the even the the hummingbirds were at their peak, you know, we would have twenty or thirty hummingbirds out here. She's built them up over the last like two years, and even with them going at it full tilt, I mean, those things don't drink. I mean, we would change them maybe maybe twice a week, probably yeah, about twice a week, every couple of days. Uh, and then right around the time that I heard that and the dog in pain, I noticed that this is about right the time, you know, that's what even justifies it even, or, you know, solidifies it in my mind even more what you said. Cause I didn't think about this till you said it, but you know, we were, even as the hummingbirds were leaving, we were still putting, you know, the sugar water out and it was just going like hotcakes. <laughs> and I didn't yeah. think about that till you mentioned it. Well, and that's got to be unnerving because my understanding is they're attached to your house, right? They're not out in the field somewhere. Right. No, it's right to the side of our. It's we have a covered porch beside our garage, and they they just hang beside that. 
and it's okay. perfect cover right up to it because we have we have tree a tree line that goes direct, like directly from the corner of our yard, which is kind of where our house sits, directly into the woods. I mean, it's it's nearly comic if you could see these trees. They, I don't know who planted these pine trees, but you know they just literally go in a line straight to the woods. Uh, so it literally is the, the perfect situation, really, for some free food or easy. Yeah, food. I think they they probably have a sweet tooth. But you know, it's interesting because Will, you were just mentioning Carol in Missouri was having that problem where she had multiple feeders and they would just, you know, she had to, I think, fill them every night or every other night. And she knew it was the creatures at her place. Yeah, that's that's too close for comfort. She she just had one. Where do you remember? Wow. So now, just out of curiosity, um, have you mentioned any of this to your wife? Or, uh, yeah, she's a little bit. She didn't hear all the stuff that I heard, so she's a little bit more skeptical. But uh, she was out of town when I was down downstairs. Uh, and that might have been actually what I was doing outside was uh, refilling her hummingbird feeders, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, she still, you know, before we stopped, she was, she realized that I was changing those feeders out a lot more than I should be, for sure. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on a little bit here. We we talked about the historic lore, the you know the precedent of these things in the mm-hmm. area, uh, the sounds, the screaming, the dogs. And the uh, hummingbird feeders, um, and I'd sent you, and I, and we'll edit this out if, if it's important. But uh, I understand you have a uh, you have your doctorate in psychology, and we wanted to we sent you I think four questions. Um, right. If we could, if we could discuss those, would be great. Sure. Okay. And now do you have those in front of you or? Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. I do. All right. Well, let's, let's, uh, we'll start with number one and get your, uh, we'd love to get your professional opinion on that. Yeah. So that's the one that you said, what could be some of the reasons people hoax Bigfoot evidence, including sightings? Exactly. And, what, what do they get out right. of it? Right. So I, when I was thinking about that, I tried to like, I just grouped people into two at starting at least groups people into two categories. The people who do not believe that this is, they don't believe in Sasquatch, you know, as an animal or any other type of being. And they just out to, you know, hurt or tarnish the community with just complete, you know, tales and lies that they make up. Uh, it's basically just devious behavior. And then you've got, I think, on the other hand, people who believe in Bigfoot and want to kind of belong and contribute to the community, you know, albeit still in a devious manner, but they're not coming at it truly from a, you know, just a, I want to hurt them. They kind of want to help the community maybe, but, you know, they're bending the truth, so to speak, to lean, you know, credence to the field or whatever. And like you said, they want to make a name for themselves, you know, could also be partially be a uh, uh, motivation for them. And I started thinking about, you know, the, you know, as humans, we have obviously have biological needs. And once those are met, you know, you get into the psychological aspect of it. And we also have, you know, which are just as valid as our biological needs of food, air, shelter, all that. And we have psychological needs that if they're not met, then, you know, that obviously uh, impacts our well-being as well. And one of those the research has shown from you know, the beginning of psychology of the field is our need to belong or our belongingness. Uh, there's this researcher named Abraham Maslow who built his research around our hierarchy of needs. And he said, once our biological needs are met, you know, we can move on to psychological needs. And he outlines those. And one of those that I thought about because of this question that you posed was the need to belong and being a part of a group uh, and how that can motivate people to lie and you know various other things uh 
So I think that explains it to a large extent. Obviously, I don't think it's going to be any one thing uh, with human behavior. It rarely is, if ever. But that need to belong was the was the main thing I thought about. You know, uh, I guess that would be more for the people who genuinely believe in Sasquatch and whether they've had a sighting or not or interaction. Uh, I think that's probably the motivation for that. And then on the the other group of people who do not believe that and kind of just want to do as much damage as they can, I think that just comes down to that and you know, research psychology research also says, shows that attention seeking behavior, you know, that can stem from anything from jealousy to a personality disorder. So, uh, I think it's a mixture of those things. Basically, when you look at the people who, you know, have no interest in this field versus the people that do, and it's more interesting to me to look at the people who do have interest in the field and why they would be, uh, hoaxing versus the people who just want to do as much damage to the field as possible. But yes, yeah, it's, it's, uh, and one of, one the, of those reasons for the, for the people that do believe in it, you said is like maybe some sort of uh, jealousy or something like that. Right. Right. Oh, you know, jealousy, low self-esteem, loneliness, you know, anything it ties back to that, our need to belong and human attachment and interactions. Uh, I don't know. It seems like, you know, but I mean, we can get that from anywhere. And I mean, it drives human behavior. It really does. Uh, yeah. That's, that's, those are the first things I thought about when I was thinking about that. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's interesting. And and they're all kind of, um, I guess they have a kind of a negative connotation, you know, that there's something, missing in that person's uh in their psychology i guess right it's kind of like a a blown up version of you know people that just go online and you know bash people on forums and stuff like that it's kind of just a extrapolated version of that like just you know like i said i don't think it's any one thing but a combination of things that lead people to do certain things yeah, and we've never seen that, have we, Will? <laughs> oh, not at all. <laughs> right. A little, little sarcasm there. Um, right. Yeah, no, that's that's a good explanation. Okay, and what was uh, the second question that we we sent you, and what, what are your thoughts on that? Right. So what is involved in people's minds when they claim to see things such as dog man slash werewolves that don't exist, but they give detailed descriptions and are adamant about it. And again, you know, I think it's groups of people who are spiteful and just making things up for attention to boost their ego and their self-worth and belongingness going back to the, the uh, uh, need to belong. But uh, then you've got the people who I think on the other hand, maybe you have genuine people who genuinely thought, they saw one of those two quote unquote beings, but they saw a Bigfoot and they're just genuinely confused about it, you know, and what, you know, despite the details they report, uh, and that could stem again from just wanting to quote unquote bend the truth and, you know, be a contributor to the field. And they, maybe they just want it to be true so bad, you know, that they even begin to believe it because, you know, people can, tell themselves lies and eventually begin to believe it as the truth. <laughs> right. Uh, well, and one okay. of the questions that I was wondering is, could they see something and they, you know, they're not trying to be deceitful. They actually believe that that's what they saw. Right. For sure. And that's, that's one thing, you know, I would, I'll say this before I forget about it, you know, until I, without the people you know, that don't believe in it, you know, to believe in Bigfoot or, you know, just think it's, you know, we're all hoaxing. They, I don't believe that even, you know, if this is, when this becomes accepted by the scientific community and is, you know, it's, you've got official, you know, research that starts going and this is cataloged and, you know, say it's, you know, cataloged just into the animal kingdom, just for an example, 
I mean, you know, there's still going to be a large part of the population who just refuses to believe it. Uh, for sure, I would believe, but uh, I would have to agree with you 100. percent And that's yeah. you know, you see that in every aspect of life where everybody has the same set of facts, the same set of circumstances, the same set of truths, if you will. Right. And but they interpret it in different ways. Look at our political yep. system. Won't go too deep into yep. that, but you know, I mean, you have right. people for whatever reason, they just are going to be driven in a certain direction. For so sure. that, that's interesting. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, okay. Well, let's, yeah, we'll move on. I think we had a third one in there. Yeah, and this is the most interesting to me. Uh, what are the traumatizing effects of genuine encounters with a Sasquatch and why certain things, including the entire event, uh, could possibly be suppressed within the witness's mind? And this kind of ties into that previous question about, you know, what if someone sees, you know, a Bigfoot Sasquatch, but they report it, you know, as a dog man or werewolf. Uh, there's one thing that throughout psychological research has shown in memory is that we are poor at giving eyewitness testimony and recalling detail after the fact, you know, if something happens, especially a high stress situation, we can recall certain things, you know, with a level of detail, but it is not the most reliable thing on earth. Uh, and there's study after study that shows this. Uh, and one thing that, uh, goes, feeds into that is, you know, rather than, you know, our brains just don't record experience, our experiences flawlessly. So our memories, you know, are very susceptible to biases and errors just because, you know, we may, like I said, experience something stressful, which I have to imagine encountering one of these beings in the woods would, I would qualify as stressful. Uh, you know, that's, our memory is going to fill in some of the gaps after the fact and our, our previous experiences influence how we recall things in the present, in the present, you know, because that's all we have to go on. So, uh, it can, our, our, uh, eyewitness testimony, you know, and just going back and uh, recalling things, especially given stressful, um, situations is, is far from perfect as humans. And, you know, that's not even getting into the suppressed memories, uh, which there is research that shows, how, you know, that has delved into how these are created in the process that are uh, created this. And it gets into learning research and it's called state dependent learning. So uh, the brain creates memories when we're in a certain mood or state, particularly in one of stress or trauma. And those memories can literally become inaccessible in the normal state of consciousness. The, the brain just, you know, for lack of a better term, it just protects itself. Uh, so it's interesting research on, you know, how the brain hides memories from our conscious state. Does it ever, if it, if that happens, does there ever come a point where maybe over time the person's calmed down, um, it sort of comes back up and they start to remember bits and pieces or yeah. any, anything on That's basically on that. the only thing that it, that's the chief thing that it takes is time because through that process of state dependent learning, that's how, you know, people get to that blocking out. It's just called disassociative amnesia and it can, it doesn't have to be permanent. Sometimes with some people, you know, after a while and maybe they make, you know, related memories that are not, you know, as traumatic that can help the brain uh, to help kind of, consolidate all that together and it comes back to them but time is uh about the best factor in that so it must be like a well like a defense or self-preservation mechanism i'm just yep. trying to think of what it would benefit it's got to be something like that right right yeah i mean it would you know if it was true i mean in the case of you know Sasquatch encounter being, like I said, again, I would qualify that as highly stressful. But then, you know, you've got 
you know, you just think of any stressful event that somebody could, you know, would be a car wreck or something like that. Uh, it's just, it's just the brain protecting itself. You know what I mean? If it, it could, or any other event, just any kind of event that would cause anxiety or depression, mainly, you know, I'm thinking about anxiety with, uh, with a Sasquatch encounter, you know, if it got to the point where it was so bad that it started to hinder your daily functioning, you know, then that's when that pays off, you know, the brain protecting itself. And, uh, but that, that's what the, uh, you know, I was reading more and more. It's been a long time since I read about, uh, memory and learning research, but our brains are quite amazing. Yeah, no, that is that is interesting. It also, and it, it just kind of makes me wonder about. I think in, uh, and I don't know a lot about this, but the federal rules of evidence. Uh, one of the uh, one of those rules is a witness testimony. So I'm just curious mm. how this could potentially. I don't know if they're ever going to get into a situation of testifying about Bigfoot in court, but. Uh, right. Uh, just makes you wonder uh, about the validity of that. Well, that probably goes into the jury part, Tom. You know, whether the person's believable or whatever. It depends on the details sure. and if they're corroborated. Right. That would make sense, yeah. All right, and what was the fourth question? I think that was it, wasn't it? That was it. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, I got to say, this has been really interesting, um, and especially, you know, that you, for all intents and purposes, seem to have this activity going on your property there. Mm-hmm. It makes me wonder what it's going to be like next spring. Uh, I'm interested to see how the if the feeders will keep uh, if we'll keep running through the the, the uh, hummingbird feeder in the spring because that'll that'll really unnerve me and I'm planning on I'm well, you know when we talked about it I've already uh, ordered a uh, camera one of those uh, timer cameras or whatever I'll search yeah. forever because there's so many of them but uh, well even an audio hopefully. recorder I I think it'd be interesting to have an audio recorder so you could hear something approaching you definitely hear something messing with the bird feeder right and yeah for sure it'd be interesting to look at the bird feeder the next day and see if there's handprints you know maybe some mm-hmm. big handprints on there and i wish the ground i wish the ground was softer it's, you can't i mean even something that's hundreds of pounds i don't think we would be able to see it here because it's the, the ground is just so hard right well, you could always go down to your local uh, gardening store, get a few, you know, fill the back of the truck with uh, some soil, put some dirt down there, and maybe run the sprinkler on it. <laughs> yeah, that's not a bad <laughs> idea. Know. Yeah, see what happens. Right. Well, that would be something, wouldn't it, if you saw some big footprints and greasy handprints on those things. Right. And I've I've pissed them off because now I've got them, they've gotten them muddy. So. <laughs> Maybe right. get into a, a mud hole for their their quick dessert stop. <laughs> well, and they are a little bit volatile. They're kind of uh, temperamental creatures. At least right. the ones out yeah, that's, right. that's the impression I get. The story, that's why when you, I mean, I did not even think about the hummingbird figures until you mentioned it. And cause I think that's what I think, yeah, I thought it was, you know, going down there that night to do when I was outside when I heard it is, uh, but I was saying that to say that's that's why it, you know freaked me out so much is because those are the when I hear those stories of the one you know it's it's one thing I know it would be traumatic and scary enough encountering one while you're out hunting or hiking but to have one or more coming to your house and terrorizing you like that's a whole other level of terror you know what i mean because it's, oh, it's a know, the home is a sacred place you, yeah you it's feel, violating that, that boundary yeah that sacred boundary right. sure 
And that's when I would be like, brain, do your work, block this out. <laughs> well, and if they're going to continue coming around, they'll typically ramp up their behavior, too. Right. And that is terrifying. Well, I remember when we had the discussion, and again, I don't remember how we got onto it, but fortuitously we did. And uh, I remember when I mentioned it, and what I noticed was you got quiet. And I could just kind of hear the gears grinding, pondering this new, new bit of information. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it would yeah. be... Uh, mm-hmm. It would be something to have these things on, you know, right there, arm's reach in your, you know, from your property, from your house. Right. Because it's pretty, I mean, I'm sure it's happened in more populated areas, but out here in our community, it's, I mean, we obviously, like I've mentioned earlier, we have neighbors, but I mean, it's, and it's so dark out here at night, like our security lot on our property, because our property is only maybe three acres that our house sits on and it's just so dark out here. It would be the perfect place to scope out some food sources. Uh, now that I think about it, cause it's pretty quiet besides the dogs. Uh, it's pretty, it would be ideal. Nothing. Well, those dogs, that whole circumstances was interesting as well. Well, what would yeah, because it, that? No, but I mean, he's that guy is not going to do that to his dogs. I don't know him well, but I know him well enough that he's not going to pick up his dog and harm it in that way. And it had to be something with, I would assume, with you know, hands. Not, I don't think there's not there's no animals. And I mean, I'm assuming that it was picked up because it did sound it didn't sound like you know you can hear when dogs get into a fight. Like I mean, I know what that sounds like. You can hear because they continue to growl, but this just went from barking to complete yipping, and then the yip cut off immediately. So it was just uh, creepy, to say the least. Well, you know, when you're telling me that, I'm like, okay, did the creature actually go up to the dog, or did it maybe hit it with a rock? And if it did, I mean, there'd probably be plenty of force. I mean, it could pick up a bowling ball and Probably threw out a hundred yards or so. I mean, they're right. powerful creatures. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it would be interesting if uh, if you could just you know have a chat with your neighbor. I, I I can't imagine just going up and saying, "Hey, uh, what do you what happened to the dogs?" But you know, I don't know how you'd approach that. But who knows? Maybe over time you'll get a chance to. Right, I hope so. Well, listen, John, we appreciate this tremendously. And uh, if stay on after the show, we got a couple questions for you. Okay. And uh, we'll, we'll go from there. So thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in this week. Thanks for having me. In Bigfoot history, Warm Springs Reservation, Oregon, Fall 1967. Clyde Staley, Portland, told John Furman that a road contractor had told him giant human-like tracks had been seen near Trout Lake and photographed by a deputy from the sheriff's office on the reservation. John called at the deputy's home and was told by his wife that she had heard about the tracks and also of a trailer being violently shoved. However, the sheriff did not answer John's letter. Bigfoot Lore Alive in Estacada Area, Clackamas County, Oregon. Long History of Alleged Encounters in Estacada by Vanessa Von Voris for the Estacada News, October 1st, 2008. While hiking along the snowy banks of the Clackamas River late one January afternoon in 1969, Millie Kiggins of Estacada, her husband, and their friend Art Schneider found something that would thrust the Kingans and the quiet wilderness surrounding Estacada into an international spotlight. 
we went to look at a Forest Service cabin up above Squaw Lake on the way to Cold Springs about 20 miles from Estacada, Kiggins said. They were going to sell them, and we wanted to look at them. We started out late, and we were in about three feet of snow. There was a gate, and we couldn't get through. So we started to walk, and it looked like somebody had already gotten through because there were tracks in the snow. They noticed the large size of the tracks and their depth. They were 18 inches deep, she said. Whatever had made them was heavy, because ours were a couple inches deep. It had to have been walking on two feet, and its stride was 67 inches. The path of the tracks was in an unusually straight line, too straight to be man-made footprints, she said. The hikers followed the imprints for about a quarter mile before they realized it was getting late and decided to turn back. Before leaving, Kiggins documented their discovery with a photograph and contacted the U.S. Forest Service. They said it was a snowshoe rabbit. I have no idea what it was, but if it was a rabbit, it would have to be a big one to make prints that big. I told them if it was a snowshoe rabbit, they had better look out because it's big enough to eat them, she said. Back at home on their farm, on the outskirts of Estacada, the Kigginses began to experience a series of Bigfoot-like phenomena. He was around here for a year, she said. We found footprints all over the farm. Once they led to a five-foot fence and continued on the other side uninterrupted, as if he stepped right over it. Sometimes we would smell him. Smelled like a bad nursing home. We heard loud screams and grunts all at once, lasting ten or fifteen seconds. It could be heard miles away. The hair on the back of your neck would stand up. It spooked the cattle. Kiggin sent a copy of her picture to Bigfoot hunter John Green, who later visited her with Roger Patterson, famous for the Patterson-Gimlin Bigfoot film footage from 1967. K.A.T.U. interviewed her, and she was included in a British television documentary. Her photograph was published in a book written by a wildlife biologist and in a fifth-grade textbook. During the early 1970s, Estacada became a hotspot for Bigfoot enthusiasts, Scientists, hunters, trappers, and the media came from throughout the country and across the sea in the hope of gathering evidence of the existence of an elusive, shadowy creature that walks the forest on two legs. Many of the Bigfoot hunters also came looking for Kiggins. Eventually, the Estacada Police Department, back when Estacada had one, helped put a stop to it. We had all sorts of crackpots up here, she said, and I guess I'm one of them because I saw the tracks, but I can't help that. For anonymous first-hand accounts of Bigfoot phenomena, enthusiasts can now peruse the databases of websites such as OregonBigfoot.com and BigfootEncounters.com that collectively contain approximately 40 reports for the Estacada area alone between 1912 and 2006. A U.S. Forest Service employee, who does not wish to be identified, said she has never taken a single Bigfoot report in the 12 years she has worked at the desk of the Clackamas River Ranger District Office in Estacada. We don't have a book or a piece of paper that states sightings at all, she said. She refused to comment further for fear she would, quote, get in trouble again, unquote. There is at least one highly photographed, easily accessible Bigfoot in Estacada, a menacing replica created by a chainsaw artist. It guards the entrance to Mike's second-hand store and holds a sign warning potential shoplifters they will be eaten. I've heard second- or third-hand stories, store owner Mike Doolittle said. I would think that if there was a Bigfoot, I would have heard about it on the 6 o'clock news. I know Santa Claus is real because I've seen him. I've never seen a Bigfoot. Kiggins has never seen Bigfoot either, and she is careful to emphasize that she is not exactly sure what created the strange tracks, the spooky sounds, or the awful smell. Although nearly 40 years have passed since she photographed the tracks in the snow, she still gets correspondence from Bigfoot enthusiasts. I recently got a letter from a guy in England who wants to know about it, she laughed. I don't know if I'm going to write back. It might be just another crackpot. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open now.